Fire has a couple of different but, but very closely related impacts on streams and our catchments. Uh, I'll split them up into three here. The first one is the water quality or the water yield from our forests. Uh, and yield impacts uh, occur at, at two scales. There's a short-term scale, the first few years after fire, uh, possibly up to five, usually a bit shorter, and then some potential long-term issues, which are ones that are, uh, can be a bit alarming. Um, water quality, for example, our drinking water or water for industrial purposes, uh, that's a short-term process, but it's the one that's probably um, would be exercising catchment managers' minds the most uh, right now. It's usually worse in the first one, two, three years, but it can, it can keep going for a little bit longer in some circumstances, and the combination of those can have an effect on uh, aquatic habitat, with, by which I mean the stream health, uh, all the bugs and the flora and fauna in the streams. I'm not going to talk about that too much because I don't know enough about it. It is a rather under-researched uh, component of, the, of uh, fire effects in Australia, I think. Uh, this is a schematic of, so I've just suggested there'll be some changes. This is a schematic of the processes that occur on a hill slope or a catchment, and I'm talking about forested catchments here, uh, that control how water, sediments, nutrients, etc., move around uh, on those hill slopes. And the, you don't really need to get too fixated on all the uh, various components of this, but You'll notice there's some arrows there. The red ones are denoting a decrease in the rate of that process and the green ones, which are going up, an increase. And I, I guess the, the main message out of that, there's a lot of processes uh, change after a fire. It's the biggest impact you can, you can, have on a, you can uh, apply to a forest. Uh, and for example, uh, the ones up the top there, looking at the, about the canopy interception and the transpiration, uh, obviously if all the leaves have gone off a tree, it's not going to be able to transpire anymore. It can't intercept water and, and that can be up to 25% uh, of a rainfall event. The rain never hits the ground, it gets intercepted by the canopy. If that's gone, then there's a whole lot more water uh, in the system in the first, uh, until there's a recovery of that canopy. And for an example, um, evapotranspiration could be as much as 1,200 millimetres in some of our forests. That's when it used to rain properly. Um, and so of that, a lot of it is, is no longer going to be transpired for the first year, one, two, three, four years. Just to illustrate this point, here's a 70-year-old wet eucalypt forest. This forest would have been burned in the 1939 fires. Um, very dense forest. Uh, these are big pumps for water. As I said, they can transpire up to 1,200 millimetres of rain a year, probably around 60 to 70 per cent of any given rainfall. That happens to it, they turn into this. And now there's, there's quite a bit of this around. Uh, now, clearly, there are no, those trees are dead. There happen to be alpine ash um, up in the uh, East Kiwa from after the 2003 fires, but there's uh, plenty of this around closer to home now. Um, so those trees are going to die, uh, and for a while they won't be transpiring very much at all. If you add that to some impacts on soil, um, the now exposed soil, um, water repellency is something that gardeners will be quite familiar with. When you go out and try and water your garden in summer, uh, often the water just rolls along the top of the, of the, the uh, soil. And this is a, it's a natural phenomenon in our eucalypt forests in the summer, but it, it tends to break down in the winter. When we have a fire, we know that it, it both exacerbates that condition and it also prolongs it. So it goes into winter, it's still water repellent and possibly into, through two winters. What this means is the infiltration, the ability of the soil to infiltrate rainfall is decreased as well. There's more, more water hitting it and it's less easily infiltrated, which means there's a greater potential of water to flow along the top of the ground and into the streams. And if we get enough heavy rainfall in this condition, then these are the kind of things that can happen. And this is a flash flood at La Cola, 2007, only a month or so after the 2006-07 fires. A few months later, there were the Gippsland floods. Um, so this is, a, this is a real risk. For longer term yield, although I, I should go back and say, and I will labour this point a bit, it is a risk, but it's not necessarily going to happen. Um, the longer term yield, effects are driven by the ecology of our forests and we really have two and certainly as a hydrologist I think of this in two sort of buckets a, a botanist or a forester would be horrified at this um, but we have the ash type species the mountain ash the uh, alpine ash and, and some associated species 
Uh, and these are the ones that a lot of our, our Melbourne's catchment areas are comprised of, the, the big, wet, beautiful forests. And then all the rest, which is, is where the botanists and the foresters <laughs> get a bit worried, uh, where hydrologically I tend to put them in a, in a bucket called all the rest, the mixed, mixed species eukes and their associated wattles, etc., etc. And why we, we make this distinction is that the ash species are distinguished by their sensitivity to fire. So a fire kills the ash if it's hot enough, uh, they then trigger this immense seed fall, it hits an ash bed that's just waiting to there to germinate the seeds and you get this very dense regeneration that comes back. And to put simply, the young forest is thirstier than the older forest. Um, at, over time, there's natural competition, thins out um, uh, the stands and they begin to use less and less water and uh, the less water means more water uh, going into the stream networks. But the younger forests use, use more. Now this is a curve, the famous Kazera curve, which George Kazera was a, a researcher here um, uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, and he and, and some sub, a lot of subsequent really excellent uh, research came up with this curve, which is more of a conceptual model, if you like, rather than a cast in stone set of numbers. But what this describes is uh, the water yield on this axis uh, and then the forest age over here, and that's from zero to 250 years. And what this shows is that um, this dotted line would be the water yield before there was a, a disturbance, then after year zero you get this initial increase that I was just suggesting would happen, and then it takes us quite a few decades for the forest to recover its water yield. So this bit in here is the, is the water that's missing. Um, now this is relative to an old growth forest of which is almost none left and 100% burnt and those are two quite key um, things to keep in mind. Um, most of our, in fact all of the ash that was burnt in this latest fire were probably 70 years old which means their yield is down here, they're already down on the curve so the actual decrease that we could predict from this curve is less already because of that. Uh, about 30% of Melbourne's catchment area was burnt, so there's a few alarm bells ringing there. However, significant of those areas didn't crown. Not to say there weren't, wasn't plenty that did, but there was quite a bit that didn't. So a, a sort of low to medium intensity fire, no crowning. You're not going to end up with that, that um, forest of sticks, if you like. You're going to end up with something like this a, a year or so after fire, where there's a, an understory that's starting to recover, but the trees are still are still operating uh, largely as they did before. And this is the O'Shaughnessy catchment, one of Melbourne Water's catchments, that initially uh, there, was, there was a lot of alarm about this. It was mapped as being 93% burnt early on. The, I'm, I should add here, the fire severity mapping is still going on, so we're not too sure exactly what's happened out there yet. Uh, you can see there's some stripes uh, around the ridges uh, where there's definitely a kill of the ash, but a lot of this appears to be unburnt. We know that underneath there's quite a lot of burnings gone on in the underst understory, but that's not going to you know, result in this, this Kazira type effect. If we look at the Maroondah, which is another one of Melbourne's catchments, um, we can see there's a lot, lot more of a severe effect here, but we can also see there's a lot of it that doesn't have that, that brown, dead um, uh, view. So. There's a, lot, there's, a, there's a lot in terms of the range of burn severities and the, and the ecological responses, which makes it a bit difficult to make blanket statements about this. But certainly, until we have all the information, we're going to struggle to predict the impacts in any great detail. But one of the other things to touch on here is this rather heavily burnt area here is actually mostly mixed species, not this ash, not the, not the ash species. And these mixed species are fire resistant. Unless, you, you, unless the fire comes along and really reduces them also, almost to charcoal, they'll survive. Um, and they send out epicormic shoots, you get that hairy tree thing, that the uh, beloved of the media. Um, and that means the tree's still alive. It takes a while to get going again, and the more severe the fire, the longer that will be. Um, and certainly in the northeast, we've seen the drought impact has, has made that recovery uh, harder for those trees we've seen in the last few years. Um, but if it's only lightly burnt, the canopy will recover quite quickly and there'll be very little hydrologic change. In the long term, we're much less certain 
of that, and this is a serious knowledge gap if we're trying to predict bushfire effects. Um, we, people like me have done some modelling of this and others. We make up almost what happens to those. Um, so it's, a, it, it's an area... Of, so ecologically and hydrologically we know very little about a lot of our forests, and that's a severe knowledge gap. There's these mixed forests um, recovering away there. They've been severely burnt, but, but they're still going. So a summary uh, on this water yield side would suggest that there's, there's going to be some extra water. If you're thinking about water supplies, there's a good news story for a few years. So you get some in the bank. If, however, the rainfall is intense enough, then you get too much, uh, and flooding uh, is a possibility. In the longer term, some of these forest types can use more water than the stands they replaced, so we could get a yield decline. But we're less sure about how a lot of our forest types really do um, respond. And the impact does depend on this mix of species, uh, how much of a catchment area is burnt, uh, the severity of that fire and the post-fire rainfall. If there's uh, nice gentle rainfall, then we'll get uh, uh, some nice regeneration happening. If it doesn't rain much at all, then the catchments are damaged for longer. And the bit down the bottom, repeated fires may have a significant and could be a positive or a negative impact on water in that um, if we were to get severe fires every 20 or 30 years, then we could have, in our ash forests in particular, we could have them being set back to zero very frequently, which would mean you'd have an almost continually very young, thirsty forest. On the other hand, if you got a fire every 10 years, you would find yourself with more water, um, but you may not have the same forest type. Water quality, as I suggested up the front, is probably more pressing concern for a lot of people in fire-affected communities right now, although I guess a flood would be a problem. Um, I've already, I guess, covered some of the issues there, but again, you've got this circumstance where the for I should preface this by saying water quality from our forests is fantastic, uh, but our undisturbed forest is, is, is great for a few reasons, but it's, there is very little erosion because you've got big um, closed canopies, soil is well protected by the litter layer, the shrub layer, the understory layer, so there's not a lot of, and, and very high infiltration rates of the soil, so not a lot of erosion occurs. But when a fire comes along, that's all changed. As I said earlier, um, you've got water repellency developing, you've got no more protection um, from the rainfall, there's more rain, uh, or sorry, more water hitting the surface, there's more transporting power, there's that potential for overland flow because of repellency. Uh, soil nutrient stores are increased after a fire, so there's more nutrients ready to move around. Uh, dissolve, they can move in a dissolved form or they attach to clay particles. So there's a, there's a great potential for significantly increased stream loadings. How big? Well, this is a, a graph of, or a, a depiction of um, research from both from Australia and overseas from the last few years. Um, and this shows the change in annual sediment loads due to fire in the first year after fire. So this one here means it was a four times uh, the pre-fire load, a nine times, 21 times, 170 times, 1,000 times. Very, very variable. And other studies have found no impact at all. So it's kind of hard when people say what's going to happen uh, to give them a sensible answer. And the reasons for this are the, the, the suspects that go along with, with the water yield changes. That's the burn severity, the rate of the vegetation recovery, and most importantly, the post-fire rainfall intensity and volume. Now, in, uh, when we get those load increases of perhaps 100 times, that's usually where we've had in, intense thunderstorm activity not long after fire. Um, a big dump of rain doesn't have to go on for that long, but it can move a lot of stuff very, very quickly. And the Tambo, uh, the Buckland River, some of you might recall, the only person killed in the 2003 fires was killed by what would be popularly called a flash flood in the, in the Buckland um, from an hour, less than an hour's rainfall. So the faster the, the vegetation recovers, the less of a risk for that happening. Um, and interestingly, we, we kind of think there's probably less of a risk to water quality in the wetter forest types because of that, um, that, that vegetation recovery issue. Um, and, and also, uh, from research we did in the East Kiwa after 2003 fires, we got 70 or 80 per cent of our sediment loads from just two rainfall events in the first year. So um, 
it's very, very uh, dependent on what the rainfall does. About three or four Fridays ago, uh, we were out looking at some of the burnt areas and we got that storm that some of you might remember. It probably rained for half an hour or so, reasonably heavy. I don't actually know what the statistics are, but we ended up at Sunday Creek, which is uh, the water supply catchment for Kilmore and Broadford, very heavily burnt. Um, you can see steep slopes, nothing protecting uh, the soil. And this is um, a bunch of, a, a wadge of sludge with a, an ash layer about that thick on the top. It's probably about a metre and a half deep. It's butting up against the road. Um, and that's happened from about, um, as I said, less than an hour's rainfall. And this has taken just slightly down, further down the system, and that's heading its way directly into the reservoir that's feeding Broadford uh, and Kilmore. Um, so, you know, another an hour's worth of that rainfall event, and there would be, you know, quite catastrophic uh, issues for those, for those people. Um, debris flows, which is actually the technical name for the flow that killed the, the firefighter in 2003, uh, are a, a mass movement event um, that gouge out um, stream, stream, uh, stream networks. Um, this is a, one of our PhD students who's, uh, as we speak, up there researching this sort of thing. But there's a scar on the tree there that shows you how, how high the flow would have been down through here. Um, and this... Um, lost a bit of text off the side here, but, but this is uh, a drier forest type, um, very little soil recovery, steep, shallower soils, water repellent, uh, and very fragile. If you get a rainfall cell that's, that's, that's uh, intense enough, then, then these are the kind of things that can happen. And this was a farmer took a photo of, of one of these things coming out of the hills, across the road, and across his paddock. Um, and this was a year after the 2006... 07 fires, so the catchment's still in vulnerable state to get that rainfall event that will trigger these things. Just something uh, to finish up on in terms of the vegetation recovery. This is a graph of sediment lows that we measured in, in, a, in an experimental work up in the East Kiwa after 2003. This shows simply the loads as, a, as, as a, the annual loads after the fire, and this is the pre fire. Um, value here, so about a tenfold increase, reasonably benign compared to what could have happened, again in a fairly wet forest type. Uh, but you can see by the first year, uh, second year after the fire, it's, it's really coming back down. By the third year, it's almost back to normal. And that's really related, as well as the rainfall, but to the vegetation. And this, this was taken 18 months after the fire. You can see there's very, very dense regrowth uh, protecting that soil. But just over the hill, over sort of Omeo way, where the rainfall is quite a bit less, at the same time it looks like this. So the same rainfall event falling on that would, uh, that would fall on both of them have a much, much bigger effect over here. So this, this um, balance between rainfall intensity and, and soil recovery, etc., cetera, is, is one that uh, makes it difficult to predict what will happen, but does give us a pointer toward the potential uh, impacts. Again, the Maroondah, just to make the point, there's a range of burn severities out there in the landscape. We're not really all over it yet. Uh, and some of those areas will be vulnerable to erosion and some of them won't. And how they recover will be a function of, of what kind of rainfall season we get. And just to summarise that, fire can have a large uh, impact on water quality, but also may not. So I guess I'm just trying to make sure that it's not too alarmist here but it's certainly a risk that, that water authorities need to be thinking about. And some of them, like the, the folks upstream, uh, uh, that are managing the Sunday Creek, Kilmore and Broadford, will have a, a some significant problems on their hands, I would suspect. Um, because of that, fires can also have significant effects on the in-stream biota. Um, we don't know enough about that. Uh, that's definitely a knowledge gap. Um, the extent of that impact will be some function of uh, rainfall amount, intensity, burn severity, vegetation recovery, etc., etc., and, and so it means it's very variable. And, and predicting the impact is about estimating a risk uh, based on all of the above factors. And that's it. Thanks.